Welcome to Pulpcast, the official podcast of thepulpmedia.com. In this podcast, we discuss everything in pulp culture, from comic books to movies and video games. This week, we're speaking with Andrew McLean, the writer and artist on Headlopper at Image Comics. All right. So how did you get into comics? Did you start reading as a kid, or was it something that you kind of got into as a teenage years? When was it that you first kind of got that love for comics? I mean, I don't, I don't really remember not not having it really. I mean, we, my my dad had read a, a little bit of comics uh, when he was a kid. He mostly read like uh, some of the Dracula comics or something, which I think is kind of cool that he read those instead of. I don't know, Subir or something. Not what I expected when I asked him about it. But um, so we just had him in the house when I was really little, and I had an older brother who was into it. And uh, so since the time I, I was, you know, alive, I, I can't remember not having at least some comics around and reading them and trying to draw the uh, and draw the panels and everything out of them. All right. So what, like, did you get into like Marvel stuff first or were you DC kid or were you more into creator owned? I wasn't, I wasn't, didn't really have the luxury of being into any, any one thing. Cause I grew up in a really small kind of shitty town and, uh, we just didn't have, we just didn't have a comic shop. Um, and, and a couple that we had like, we had like a spinner rack at, at a pharmacy and we had like, there'd be some comics tucked into like the magazine section at, at our grocery store. But the, uh, there was no, first there was no real consistency in what titles they would carry. It was kind of like, you know, a mixed bag month to month. And, uh, and also we just didn't have much money. I wasn't like, there wasn't really like, we just didn't buy them often. It was something that like we would get like a handful or something at, at Christmas in uh, like a stocking or, or something, you know? So we just had this, like, we just had this collection of them and it grew only very slowly over the years. And I basically just read those ones over and over again. And then when, when we were out of town and I could find a, I could find a, uh, um, a comic shop, I would buy something. If I could, you know, you know, at, at some point it was the 90s. So I was trying to buy, I was trying to buy Image and I was trying to buy X Men and and Spider Man mostly when I was a kid, but I, I was taking kind of whatever I could really get my hands on. And then, so what led you from from that interest of comics into actually wanting to draw them? It, 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 there wasn't any like it just all kind of always kind of always was that way. Even when I was little, I loved to draw and I loved comics, and the the reason I loved comics was primarily the art. I love I loved characters, but it was like the art that got me uh, into comics in the first place. So it was, you know, when I, I always wanted to do uh, it, it, I jumped around being a kid. I was like, oh, I wanted to play like professional baseball when I when it was little league season. But then I wanted to draw comics when it was winter. You know what I mean? It was whatever. You, you know, comics making comics as a job was always something that came back. You know, even if I would uh, forget about it for a minute. And so did those early comics influence you a lot or did you start getting into like manga or anything like that that started to help develop your style? Um, I didn't really get into manga in, until like much, much later. I wasn't really, we didn't have any, I didn't know anyone who read any manga and, uh, and there wasn't even any anime on TV until I was like in high school already. And then that's kind of the one Dragon Ball Z made its really its big like American you know presence, um, you know anyway in that day and age any of my friends who also dug comics they loved, you know, uh, they loved we all loved Todd McFarlane's like that was we only knew a handful of names you know what I mean from like reading Wizard or whatever so I didn't have. I, if I could have drawn a certain way as a kid, if I had that like ability, I would have drawn just like Todd McFarlane as a kid, you know, but, uh, it's kind of strange. It didn't occur. It didn't really occur to me that like, I, I, that style is something that I should kind of develop or even really pay attention to, to until I was like in college until I was like 25. And I realized that I was drawing 
every time I sat down, I would either draw differently or I'd be like, okay, this time I'm going to draw this way. And then sometime when I was around 25 and I was like, you know, maybe, maybe I'll actually make some comics. It occurred to me like, oh, my, my style could be, you know, something that is um, a piece of like identity. Do you know what I mean? And that's when I started to try to focus and actually do what I was going to do. Otherwise it was like one second, I was trying to draw something like scratchy and cartoony, like, um, you know, like some of the cartoons by, uh, um, I really loved like Tim Burton movies and stuff and those kind of like scratchy, not very comic-y, almost children's style drawings. And so one second I would draw like that and then next second I would do my very best poor effort at like a, you know, you know, Marvel house style type thing. And then eventually I was just like, you know what? My favorite artists don't draw like either any of these options, you know? So I started to try to like pay attention to what I'm actually drawn to and and uh, and, and incorporate it, incorporate those types of shapes and colors and things. That's awesome. And I think that's really important. I like what you mentioned of how like, you know, it kind of became your like trademark or your identity as an artist, your style. So I just kind of came, I kind of became fascinated in that idea with other artists. Do you know what I mean? Like the idea, you know, people who, who aren't super into comics or illustration or something, the idea that, you know, people who are kind of uh, familiar can look at a, a drawing or something or a piece of art by someone and just instantly tell who did it, it blows them away, but, or does it blow them away? They're just like, I don't see it. That look, who, who knows who, who drew that? Looks like the same person. But, uh, and that is that always kind of fascinated me. So I just I thought to, I thought at some point like I'd like to have something, I'd like to do something that is unique that has like an an identity to it. You know what I mean? Has some kind of magic, if if you can if you can bottle that type of thing. Well, speaking of identity and magic, I think you definitely nailed it with Headlopper, and the the whole vibe you're going for there. So let's talk about that. Thanks, dude. Yeah, go for it. So where did this idea come from to have this kind of like fantasy comedic uh, story um, that's kind of very different than Apocalyptic Girl? Uh, I just love genre stuff in general. You know, I, just, I did Apocalyptic Girl because I love sci-fi and the character just seemed like she would, um, she, she just felt like she belonged kind of in a more post-apocalyptic type version of sci-fi. But I, like, I love genre in general. I'm not particularly like all about fantasy or all about sci-fi. There's all kinds of stuff that I like. Um, but I, I always loved fantasy, you know, growing up um, and currently. And um, I've always been a big fan of heavy metal music and everything. So that was really, really close to the beginning of it. I just wanted to do a fun comic. Uh, and I, I wanted to be really metal. I, I, sometimes I feel like the, um, you know, it's like the main characters, they're always like, they're always like, like white men, the same type of like, like body structure build. They have the same face. You know what I mean? Like so many of our main characters in, in anything are kind of the same. And sometimes it's those, the side characters that are a little like quirkier or something that actually seem like, more interesting characters to me. So when I, when I was first deciding I wanted to do something like Headlopper, I thought a character like Norgal almost seemed like a character that you would see, you know, if you're watching a movie that you don't see this character pop up for like, you know, you'd get 10 minutes of screen, screen time with this guy. But at the same time, you'd be left being like, I don't know, that guy was kind of cooler than the main character. Why, what, where'd the beard guy go? You know what I mean? So I just wanted to do, I wanted to do a whole book that was just about, you know, this fucking, some crazy kind of heavy metal looking guy uh, who just kind of was an unstoppable killing machine. You know what I mean? And I actually, I didn't set out to make it funny. Uh, not at all, actually. I just sat down and as I was writing, if something funny it would pop into my head i would be like hey that'd be kind of funny if this happened and i just i guess i assumed i didn't i wasn't aware that so many people would pick up on the humor of it and then and then luckily i was like all right cool like people people can dig the same type of jokes that i dig you know what i mean and then all of a sudden i like you like everyone is like oh yeah this is a it's a really funny book and i was like i never knew that it would be a funny book you know 
Well, I think that helps a good contrast because you're reading this book, and I mean, it's not it's not like dark, but it's it's kind of heavy, like you said, metal. So I think you can kind of you kind of or readers grasp that like tone, and so I think the humor kind of offsets that a little bit and creates this nice balance. Yeah, hopefully, I try not to think about it too too much, and like try to I, tr- I try not to think about what the uh, ratio might be or something. I I hope that it just continues to come from a place of kind of. Uh, I don't know, ignorance of, of someone's expectations. Do you know what I mean? I hope it just comes off as uh, genuine still. Yeah, it definitely feels natural. Cool. Thanks, man. So in it, what themes are you exploring? What's what's kind of your message that you're wanting to, to tell? Or is this just a fun story? Yeah, there's definitely no message. Not not one bit of message. <laughs> I mean, I have... I have char- the characters have... Uh, have their own personalities and if they have a message you know they they may put it forward um i uh but there's no like moral or real message i think the closest thing i came to putting a message in there is just like (laughs) and this is probably revealing the closest time i got to actually putting like my own message in there is some of the little rants or something that maybe Barra has at the end when he's being, you know, particularly bleak and, uh, and, uh, insulting towards humans. <laughs> but, but, but otherwise, uh, I don't, I don't like reading a book that personally, I, I just want a fun adventure and hopefully the areas that are supposed to kind of pull it, your heartstrings are from a place of just being human. They're not from a place of trying to teach you. Do you know what I mean? Is Hopefully you'll relate to it, be like, oh, I, I have loved ones, or I think what happened to that person was wrong, and I'd like that bad guy to get what's coming to them. You know what I mean? That's the, maybe that's the closest to a message, is just like, just at least bits and pieces of it are just relatable if you're, if you're alive, you know what I mean? If you have friends and family and things. So more sympathy and empathy than like, hey, let's teach you a lesson. Yeah, but even ask even for me to even answer the question is already is already give me giving uh, a message for the book more thought than I have while creating the book. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I just I'm trying to I'm just making like an adventure uh and 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 have fun. I don't have like I don't have an agenda personally in the book. I think that's just you turn on any social media and it's just everyone's got a fucking it's just whether you agree with it or not like you know it's just it's it's like agendas it's like the whole, the whole world is, is is constantly talking about you know their message it's like and i just i don't know sometimes there's a there, there needs to be some venues that you can just relax in and have fun and enjoy and also if you find your own personal message in it then by all means champion that message through this piece of entertainment be it head opera or a song or something it's like some people will read they'll read lyrics of a song like oh i think it's talking about this and then someone will get different interpretation of the same lyrics and both those interpretations are probably just interpretations that each individual interpreter would like to get out of it you know what i mean and so like if people would like to do that with head opera by all means i welcome it but from this side, uh, I'm just trying to make people have fun. Uh, I just, I hope it's fun. Well, it definitely is. I think that's a great answer too. I really appreciate that. Uh, what decisions or decision led to making it a quarterly? Was it just to get more pages or was it just kind of more convenient that way? Uh, um, probably both. The first and foremost was that I'd self-published um, two, two, um, two smaller comics of Head Lobber before, uh, before Image picked it up. One of them was 22 pages, one of them was 45-ish or something like that. And uh, I just, when I did the first one, the 20 some odd pages one, I felt like I just got nowhere. I felt like I didn't get as far into the store as I wanted to do, and at the same time didn't really want to compromise uh, a comfortable like pacing and a tone. And so that's why the second time we did a self-published uh, version we did it at 40 pages because it just that's where it felt comfortable and I and I ended up really liking that size that kind of 
you know, 40 plus page size. And so when Image said that they wanted to do it, I thought I was, I was dead certain they were going to say no. I was like, I would love, like in an ideal world, I would do a bigger, a bigger issue, you know, 45 pages or, or something like that. Um, but that, that's obviously just not possible to do. To actually, there's just not enough time to do anything remotely close to that in a uh, in a month. And so, uh, so I was like, I just told them, I was like, I I would love to do that and just make it quarterly, so I could make it the, the book I think is best. And I just thought they'd be like, well, yeah, that's not the market doesn't do the American market anyways doesn't do quarterly books or whatever. But they were just they're so chill over there, like yeah, if that's the book you want to make, make the book. And so. So we went for it, you know. I just, I just felt like it would make the book would be uh, a better quality. Also, I hoped that if people got used to, if people gave it a chance and they got used to it being a large chunk of story or, or um, like a, like a bigger issue, they might enjoy it and they might they might be more comfortable with being patient for three months and look at it as if they actually enjoy it, look at it as kind of like an event kind of thing. Like instead of, you know, like for, you know, new comic book day is just it's new comic book day. It's just something comes out. Do you know what I mean? But if something only comes out once every three months, the fact that it comes out, uh, not very often, hopefully it would be, hopefully it would be special. You know, that was up to me. The book would have to be good to pull that off, but you know, it's just, they do stuff like that. I feel like in Europe, you know, books only come out like, from creators, you can expect like one thing a year, two things a year. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. We can do that too. It's not a big deal, you know. I definitely think it worked. I remember picking up the first one, and uh, and then realizing it was a quarterly, and I was like, okay, you know, there's enough story here to tide me over. And then you know, life went on, and and other things came out. And then when the second issue came out, it was like this big deal that finally, like, yes, it arrives. There's another, like, good. And we knew that it was, like, substantial, too. You're not expecting, like, a 20-page thing that you're going to get through in, like, five minutes. Yeah, cool, man. Well, I, I appreciate it. I'm glad you felt that way. I, I just, I know sometimes I would be really excited about a new series came, coming up because I was really excited about the creative team on it. And I would get issue one, and uh, and I would be... I would be like done, like you said, I'd be done reading in like five minutes, but also there's so, so little story because the monthly issues are so small. I didn't learn enough about the characters of the story to actually really be excited for issue two. Does that, does that make any sense? Do you mean? Yeah, that's totally understandable. I wasn't invested yet because there was no time. So I just was like, I didn't under, I didn't understand that. You know what I mean? And, And that's how I felt as the creator. Like I said, when I created the the mini headlopper that was like twenty pages, I felt like I was like, yeah, I mean, there's not enough like character content here to give a shit about the characters yet, you know. And that's just that's kind of the nature of uh, of the industry. And and well, I mean, I guess that depends on the creative team, you know. Some people obviously pull it off. I just didn't know that I could. Right. And I think what Image is doing because more frequently than not now they're doing kind of oversized issue ones or kind of like the start oh, yeah. of new arcs. So mm-hmm. I think that's a really great um, kind of practice that they're getting into because you get a nice dose to really pull you in and to get those extra pages to add that extra plot or character right at the beginning. Then they'll kind of cut back and they'll go back to like 20 to 24. So you kind of, you know, you already have a decent foundation for them to go back mm-hmm. to that little amount. But then with Headlopper, yeah. I really enjoyed how like every single time you're getting like a really thick book and I, and the price didn't even bother me either because you know you're getting like a really substantial story every single time. I'm glad. Yeah, that was you know some criticisms that you know when I was telling like you know my friends and things like yeah you might do it this way they're like oh man you know what about people what will people think about X Y and Z and I was like I don't know I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna cross my fingers I guess and see it works out but yeah Image has been good about yeah more and more so about those those big first issues I think that's a fun idea. And they also do the thing where if a uh, if a series goes on for a while, the um, the very first trade will be pretty cheap. It'll be cheaper than you know subsequent trades and stuff. Just to encourage people to be like, hey, like give it a shot. It, you know, it might be for you, it might not, but at least at least they're gonna make the price 
uh, something that won't hurt as much if you got to the end of it and you're like, well, I'm not going to read it anymore. Do you know what I mean? Or, 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 or at least it's encouraging enough to get you to try something you might not otherwise try. I think it's great. I think it's really cool. Stuff like that and you know, free comic book day. They do, uh, they do put like, a fair amount of effort into it, I think. Yeah, they're definitely doing a great job. I love the kind of 999 trades, the first volume trades. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, yeah, it's a great incentive. I mean, ho- hopefully it makes I mean, it comes it does it definitely it's definitely a sacrifice for both, you know, the creators and the publishers to do that type of thing, but I would um I would guess if Image is still doing it, they're finding that it works out to <laughs> To everyone's benefit, both the reader and the and the creators and publishers and everyone. Definitely. So, have you learned anything specific, um, like comic making lessons from your experience with Headlopper? Or has it been kind of just like same old, same old? Um. Well, I don't know that it'll ever be same old, same old. It's it'll, I, or I hope it doesn't feel same old, same old. It's like, I mean, I, I'm trying to think if I've I. I haven't been making comics a super, super long time, you know, since I was, I don't know, maybe six or seven years or something. Um, I, I, you, hopefully you slowly get better at every little, every little thing. Um, let me think here. I don't know. There, Yeah, you know, there was one thing in particular that was unique to Headlopper over over apocalyptic girl and that is and i never i never thought that i never would have predicted that i would kind of work this way it's just that i don't i don't necessarily iron out every single detail you know i i'm usually pretty pretty organized person especially when it comes to creating but head opera was just has been a a fast enough paced thing that in my head and in my planning i can usually only keep uh you have time to get the broad strokes ready by the time i start the next issue and i sit down to like write it so but it that is a really scary idea to me but at the same time it turned out to be really fun because i would bring in some some small character that i would think would disappear immediately and then later on i would get an idea like oh like what if something like this happened okay who who could make who has the right motivation to to want that to happen? And then I'd be able to think and I'd be able to think back and be like, oh, there's that character I wasn't going to use again, but I actually thought it was really fun to draw, and I could bring them back again. So like working on Headlopper, I've as uncomfortable as it was at first, I've learned to not be quite as set in stone, so that all those little happy those happy little connections can fall into place along the way. I really thought, much like Apocalypse Girl, Headlopper would go forward just being like, like page to page, draw exactly what you wrote. Um, don't don't write it until you've made like a, a bulleted list of all the different things that happened. You know what I mean? And uh, it's a little it's a little nerve wracking doing Headlopper that way, but it's also kind of fun. You know what I mean? That kind of that risk, that kind of challenge. That's great. And so how is your process? Because you, you write and draw. So do you do like full script for yourself? Or is it kind of just like plot points? No, I really do a full script. I don't think that's, um, I think a lot of, you know, artists, um, writers don't do it that way. But for some reason, I just, I just can't, I can't, like I said, I, I'm usually fairly organized with this type of stuff, because it's just, it's better if I am. Um, but yeah, I still do. Even if I make a change, you know, on the fly while I'm drawing, I'm still starting from a uh, from a full script dialogue uh, notes about like camera shot ideas or like page layout ideas, and uh, it definitely makes it speedier when I get to the page to actually draw the thing. If I've made like a panel layout note, way more often than not, I'll actually keep that initial idea rather than change it. And it's, it definitely saves time for, for me personally, anyways. Awesome. And then how is it collaborating with Mike Spicer? It's been great, but it's, I thought, um, I thought it would be, I thought it would be really, I thought it would be really easy to do a quarterly book, even though it's long, I thought it'd be really easy, but 
I know we've both been like, you know, just making the deadlines. You know, I need to be, I need to get out in front of this next arc before we start because, you know, free time, I mean, time just gets eaten up. So it's been like, it's been great. You know, we've been working together for a long time and everything, but it's still, it's been a little bit of a breakneck pace, which just wears, just wears you down. You just get tired, you know? Yeah. So what can we expect from you coming up? Is there more Headlopper on the way or are you doing something else? No, I'm just going to do more Headlopper. Originally with, uh, with Image, um, they were just like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, this story should be wrapped up in about four issues. They're like, cool, let's do it. And that was basically the extent of the arrangement. And so when issue three came along, uh, I had always planned, I had always wanted Headlopper to be an ongoing, it's just kind of what I pictured for the character, but that's just wasn't our, the nature of our arrangement. So I hit him up, you know, when issue three came out and they're, they're really, really awesome about it. They're just like, yeah, you want to make more? Then we want to make more too, you know? And it was just, just that easy. And so, yes. So as of right now, uh, will there's a, a the trade the collection comes out in on october 5th i believe uh and it's huge it's i think it's 280 pages and um and then we'll start i guess the issue five the next arc will start i think i'm shooting for march i believe because like i said i gotta get out in front of it first because it's just a lot of content um yeah and that's it i mean i do a little oddball things here and there but really that's the vast majority of my time. That's awesome. I didn't know there's going to be more. That's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm never sh quite sure how to deliver information to people. Uh, a lot of people are surprised. Uh, maybe it's because I think it's maybe because on the covers I put like then I numbered them like one of four, two of four, three of four. I really only did that. I, I hoped that there would be more. There would be an issue five. But I, I numbered them that way just because um, when I was a kid trying to buy things in grocery stores and everything, it was hard to complete a run. And it was hard sometimes to actually just tell if I was getting what part of the story I was going to buy. So I actually just numbered them that way to help people who were like me as a kid just figure out what do I have and what's the hole in my story? Do you know what I mean? But I think a lot of people just thought that it was going to be um just a mini series and done and it obviously it's possible that that could have been it's you know fate but luckily it wasn't so going forward yeah i think i'll i'll number them probably like number five uh number five which is one of four kind of thing do you know what i mean or just put five of four six of four and make it really bizarre yeah <laughs> they'll just think they'll start thinking that i'm dealing with like fractions or something um what was I going to ask? Oh, so what kind of stuff do you read then? Do you read now like a lot of image or have you gotten into the big two or, or that kind of stuff? What kind of fuels you now creatively? Um, I, I read kind of random stuff. There's a lot of holes in some of like the classics and things that, that I, like I said, you know, there wasn't a lot of comics around when I was a kid. So there's a lot of things I missed. So like I just read Joe Dorowski's and Mobius's The Inkle for the first time, which is instantly one of my favorites. I've been reading uh, all the um, Akira books lately, um, Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, I'm, uh, I really like Taiyo Matsumoto, so I read Tekken like, Concrete re recently, and then I started reading Sunny. Um, I've been reading The Last Man uh, series. It's, uh, it's a French series that First Second has been publishing um, the English translations of. That book is... That book is amazing as well. Uh, I just read kind of, uh, I read, I read a lot of, I definitely, it definitely, I read like, like, you know, prose, like, like novels generally daily. I don't always read comics every day. So, um, lately I've been reading more books than comics, but those are the ones that I've been either, uh, working my way through or just completed recently. So I don't know. It's all over the place. Some of the stuff is in American, some of it's small press, some of it's image. I never, I actually never read any big two anymore. I'm just kind of like, I'm just not really crazy about superheroes and things. That's just, whatever. It's just a taste thing. That's fine. But uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it these days. Awesome. 
So let's wrap up with some fun questions. I always do some kind of like bizarre, goofy questions at the end just to kind of breach us back to real life. Um, so what kind of stuff, when you walk into a buffet, and this buffet can have anything in it, what do you go for first? What do you fill your fir plate, first plate with? Excuse me. And it can have anything? Oh, anything. Geez. I don't know. Um, Mexican food. It's probably Mexican. Empanadas, chimichangas, it's going to be something like that. If there's Mexican, I'm, I'm beelining. I'm beelining for that. Awesome. Who is your favorite Ninja Turtle? Uh, I think my, my favorite Ninja Turtle was always Raphael. Because um, I was that kid who, who, liked, who liked Gambit because everybody else liked Wolverine. Do you know what I mean? I was like the anti-hero, but I was like, I don't know, nonconformist or something. Like I was, I think, I think Michelangelo was supposed to be my favorite turtle, but for some reason I felt like he couldn't be. So Raphael was always my favorite turtle. All right, all right. And are there any video games or movies that you're excited for that are coming out soon? I never, I never play video games anymore, but um, it's not really by choice. Um, but I saw recently the, um, I saw the most recent trailer for the forthcoming um new legend of zelda game yeah. breath of vendor so yeah and it, it looks so good i love it i love all of the zelda games other than majora's mask i just can't play them but um i love them i love them all and uh i particularly love it when they when they make the ones that are really classic looking do you know what I mean that the link is running through fields and he's running through the woods and, and things like that rather than on the ocean or like in the air. Like I love those ones too, but I prefer him on a horse. Do you know what I mean? Some really yeah. classic kind of like o Ocarina of Time is my favorite is my favorite game of all time. So so to see that new one is is really exciting. Enough so that I'm like, ah, am I gonna have to buy that? I might have to buy that one. Buy it and then never play it. Yeah, buy it and play it nonstop for like one weekend, and then and then go back to work and feel guilty about uh, all the time I spent not drawing comics. Awesome. So, where can people find you online? Um, I think I got most of my actual like names. So, if you just if you Google Andrew McLean, I I think you'll find him. But um, so my Twitter, yeah. So I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on uh, Instagram. Um, yeah, so like I think both my Instagram and my Twitter are just Andrew underscore McLean. That might not even be right. I wish they were all exactly the same, and they're not. But yeah, it, they're findable. Actually, if, you, if people Google Andrew McLean and Headlopper, that's that's the surest bet to get all the correct spellings and everything. You have been listening to Pulpcast the official podcast of thepulpmedia.com. You can email questions that we'll answer in future episodes to thepulpmediaus at gmail.com. Also, please check out our website, thepulpmedia.com, for reviews, articles, and more.